we start then? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Forum of University Economist, I would like to warmly welcome you to this webinar on current economic crisis in Sri organized by uh, the chair 2021 of Sri Lanka Forum of University Economists, the Department of Agricultural Economics and Business Management of the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeniya. SLFUE, or Sri Lanka Forum of University Economic, Economists, is a for forum for university academics to get together, share their research, and have this discussions of this nature on uh, contemporary issues pertaining to the Sri Lankan context and maybe perhaps the world. And uh, as a practice, every time we meet, um, we organize a webinar or a workshop of, of this nature and usually on ground at one of the universities which teach economics. But this time due to COVID, uh, we are having this on virtual mode. And with that short introduction, uh, let me uh, introduce you, our panelists. Today, we have three panelists. And let me share my presentation on them. I would like to in introduce our panelist, Dr. Sarat Rajapathirana. He presently, presently serves as the chair academic program of the Advocata Institute, Colombo, Sri Lanka. And he was the former economic advisor to His Excellency, the president of Sri Lanka since 2015. And earlier, he worked as an independent consultant on international trade to the World Bank WTO, ITCN, as well as USAID. And he has authored about six books and um, published about 50 plus refereed articles. He was a World Bank staff member for about 24 years and a consultant for 10 years. And he also served as a director and main author of the World Development Report, 1987 on industrialization and trade. He was uh, the former division chief for industry trade and private sector development of the technical department of the World Bank. And he was a visiting scholar uh, of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, chief money and banking division, and also a central bank of Sri Lanka. And assistant lecturer, uh, he has served as an assistant lecturer at the University of Ceylon, then Peradeniya and a visiting lecturer at uh, the Vidyalankar University and Baker's Training Institute. And he holds a BA in um, uh, economics in, from Colombo, and he has a PhD and an MA uh, as well. And uh, so that is about uh, Dr. Sarat Prajapathirana. And next we have uh, uh, Dr. Priyanga Dunusingha. He presently serves as a senior lecturer attached to the Department of Economics, University of Colombo. He obtained his first degree in economics from the University of Colombo and pursued his higher study, studies at uh, Yushu University, Japan. And prior to joining the university, he worked as a research officer at IPS of Sri Lanka. His areas of research instead are labor market, poverty, development, economics, and trade. And he has contributed to a number of journals and also worked as a consultant to a number of organizations such as ILO, World Bank, ADB, FAO, and UNDP. And he has engaged in a number of national policy formulation exercises such as national social protection and agri national agricultural policy. And he is a steering committee member, which provides supervision for preparing the national industrial policy framework. Moreover, 
He often engages with electronic and printed media in discussing socioeconomic issues of the disadvantaged groups in the society. And uh, you might have uh, read his articles on newspapers and also I'm sure you might have seen him on television. And next we have Dr. Asanka Vijay Singh, uh, Singha. At present, he works as a research economist at the Institute of Policy Studies, OIPS in Sri Lanka. And his research interests are macroeconomic policy, international trade, labor, health economics. And he is interested in looking at the impact of adjustment cost of trade and uh, using gravity modeling in trade and econometrics. Uh, and the trade origins of populist politics. He holds a BSc in Agriculture Technology and Management from the University of Peradeniya, and an uh, MSc in Agribusiness and Applied Economics from the North Dakota State University, and a, a Master's and a PhD in Agricultural and Environmental and Development Economics from the Ohio State University. So that is about our panelists. And then um, today our moderator is Professor Lalita Siri Gunaruan. He is a professor at the Department of Economics, University of Colombo. He has a PhD from University of Paris, Pantheon Sorbonne, and an MSc in Energy Technology from AIT Thailand. Uh, he is a member of Sri Lanka Energy Managers Association and a fellow of Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. He has worked um, at various public and private organizations at various capacities. Uh, for instance, at the Batikla University of College, Rubber, Institute, uh, Rubber Research Institute, Department of National Planning, Sampat Bank, National Development Council, uh, to name a few. And he was the general manager of railway. He has also served as the secretary to the transport ministry. And he is a board member of CTP, IPS, NERD, and the NERD Center. Uh, with that introduction, I would like to invite uh, Professor Lalita Siri Gunurwan to take over and conduct uh, the panel discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hema Chandra. Uh, that was very kind of you to have introduced all of us. Uh, with just one clarification I want to make in the beginning. I'm no longer board member of CTB, Nerd Center, or IPS. I have been a board member at various stages. So let me just say that as a, as a clarification. Thank you very much, everybody, particularly our, uh, particularly our um, panelists. Uh, may I again welcome uh, you, sirs, uh, um, Dr. Premachandra, uh, sorry, Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana, uh, Dr. Asanka Vijay Singha, and Dr. Priyanka Dunu Singha. All three of you spent uh, your, your time on this valuable uh, occasion. So without uh, uh, probably uh, spending any more time from my part, let's get on to uh, the seminar. Um, um, we have to probably start it with... Uh, several questions that we have. Let me, rather than putting those as questions to you all, let me probably mark the boundaries of the discussion today because the topic is current economic crisis of Sri Lanka. Now, one may ask, is Sri Lanka really in crisis? I was uh, at a forum very recently. Some people say that there is no crisis. So why are you talking about a crisis? So first one is whether Sri Lanka is in a crisis. And if so, what are the reflections of this crisis? And what are the dimensions that we can think of Sri Lanka's economic crisis? So maybe those things can be touched upon by the panelists. And if we agree that there is a crisis and there are certain reflections on the crisis, what would what probably would have been the causes behind it? Now, a lot of people think that it is Corona, which uh, is the root cause of crisis. Now, is it true really? Or is the crisis much deep rooted than simply Corona? Or is Corona just was a trigger of a much deeper kind of malady uh, which came to surface uh, because of uh, Corona? And then also we can think of whether uh, if there is a crisis, if you all agree, even if it is not a crisis, there is a problem. And if, how do you solve this problem? How can we propose solving this problem? and what policies and uh, strategies that have uh, probably gone wrong uh, in, the, in, the, in the past. 
and also what strategies and policies which might probably work uh, to uh, to take sri lanka out of this uh, crisis or some people may say that out of the icu uh, at, at the pr present situation and some people say no no it is just a uh, embery sour so don't worry uh, 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 there may be different opinions on that so ladies and gentlemen with that uh, opening let me just lay down the uh, uh, way of discussion for your uh, understanding we will be having uh, our three panelists will be given uh, 15 minutes of presentation time in the in the beginning uh, starting with uh, uh, dr sarath rajapatirana uh, may i uh, uh, also say that dr sarath rajapatirana helped us a lot in the beginning uh, when we started sri lanka journal of economic research he was one of our Uh, eminent uh, uh, helpers and supporters and encouragers and we will start with him and then we will go to dr asanka vijay singh huh, who will probably uh, touch upon these questions and the boundaries that i laid down in a different perspective and then we go to dr priyanka dhunu singh huh, he will also touch upon the same uh, probably aspects in a different angle so we will have this uh, 15 minutes each uh, uh, presentations then we open the the floor for discussion Uh, you can have uh, uh, questions and answer session uh, from the panelists as well as from from the audience may i simply request you to mute your phones unless you want to speak up and if you speak up please uh, raise your voice by raising your hand and then we will allow you to uh, uh, speak and also you can uh, probably direct your questions to the panelists or even to the uh, to the to to others who would be probably reacting into this by uh, uh, chat box which is being uh, entertained and monitored here so once again uh, uh, wishing you a very good uh, uh, kind of discussion and a, uh, uh, learning exercise let me uh, invite dr uh, sarath rajapatirana to make his uh, submission and presentation uh, floor is open to you sir uh, thank you very much uh... Dr. Nurwan, we have been buddies for a long time now. <laughs> we have enjoyed the, the uh, companionship of uh, the, the talking these the issues now for a long time, and uh, I am honored to participate in this uh, discussion today. Thank you, sir. Three... It is an honor for us also yeah. that you are here. Yeah, and I'm so uh, yeah. Now you define it in a very uh, interesting way, and I suppose we have to start to are we in crisis? Yeah. i believe we are in a crisis crisis in the sense that um uh we have great difficulty uh in for example starting with uh economic growth going we have we our our problems began before uh, covid actually and it sort of be as you have suggested it just it is growing uh, or maybe 10 15 years at time and so it's not a sudden thing that happened we were sort of uh, uh, moving towards it so covid came as a sort of a outside the scope of what we have been doing or not doing uh, and so it only exacerbated make it a little bit more difficult to deal with the situation that we are in in, in a crisis crisis is something by definition so that that you cannot ignore <laughs> you can say i am in a crisis but i am going to look at it a uh, few a few days or few months uh, down the road we can't it's like having your uh, milk inside the refrigerator going bad you can't say i am going to look at it uh, what happens uh, three days time we know what will happen so we are in that such situation we are in a crisis the crisis is not due to uh, covid uh, but it's, uh, it is uh, made more difficult with covid because it takes attention of the government in order to uh, deal with it and with some i hope we can say at the beginning uh, some success and actually we have uh, been okay at the same age uh, compared to other comparable countries we have been okay so the thing is that we still have the difficulty of uh, get, getting uh, economic growth going uh, despite some um, uh, important uh, markers like we had a growth going after 77 then it petered out then we had uh, the end of the war and we expected a, a, a return to high growth but we didn't uh, there was no sort of a, what you would call uh, a peace dividend 
which the dividend uh, disappeared after getting a 10 10 percent gdp growth rate a year later but it, it has now gone back to we when when the covid struck we were actually struck we were actually about uh, uh, 3 percent growth our whole growth for the whole period of our independence is something like 4.1 percent uh, we it grow it grow sometimes have has a sort of a growth spurt then it it is not, no, not sustained. I believe, and it's my thesis, is that that we have not been persistent in the economic policies that we were pursuing. Uh, then the number of reasons we can come into the discussion. Being a democracy, we went from uh, uh, one system of uh, uh, one one form of the policy to another form of policy. And actually, it's the price that we have to pay. We, and I'm really glad we pay those prices. Being a democracy is a great reward. Is a great, but how to use those uh, freedom for the best, uh, important, or looking, uh, bringing our people to high level living standards, uh, making life easier for them, is that we have not uh, we have not sustained in it. We have ideas short periods of uh, prosperity followed by long periods of difficulties. And we are in such a cycle now. Uh, and so the question is, the crisis is something that we cannot, uh, we cannot ignore. And but there's another school of thought which says, don't miss, uh, don't, uh, don't miss the opportunity to use the crisis uh, in order to get things done. And there's a lot of truth to that. Few years ago, um, we wrote a book. Uh, I had the great privilege of writing a book because Ian Little, Max Gordon, and uh, uh, and uh, Richard uh, to uh, about uh, growth on on crisis. The title is uh, uh, is actually economic crisis uh, and growth uh, uh, boom crisis and adjustment. That's uh, that adjustment. That we had, we looked at over this, and we were we, uh, crisis is where we can ignore it. Crisis is that if you don't attend to it, it gets worse and worse. It's, there's no um, ready-made solution involved in it. If you neglect it, it, you go from bad to worse. So what I thought of doing in the 50 minutes to make it very easy for all of us to understand, particularly for me to understand, uh, how do we? Uh, we are in a crisis. So what can we do about? It? I think that I I, I, I I talk it I talk about it in three three categories three terms first of all I think that we can agree that there are certain things that have been done that is not very helpful I mean I'm talking about the fertilizer story uh, I'm talking about the fact that we have uh, uh, we challenge to the Maha crop not having enough fertilizer and uh, uh, and not be not having it in time, and also the sudden um, uh, switch to carbonic um, fertilizer creates a lot of problem for us. I suppose in the long run we had to do those things, but it was done um, with very short notice. So that's that's a big problem. That's something that we have to deal with. And the way to deal with it is to use all our resources, uh, administrative and otherwise, in order to. Um, Get the fertilizer to uh, distributed in time and in equal in measure uh, for the for the uh, farmers to uh, carry on with what they have been doing for hundreds or thousands of, thousands of years. Uh, so that's one. Then stopping, in other words, stopping things that were creating problems for us uh, is the first step. Second thing is that. Um, we we are there's a suggestion to import vehicles uh, paid, paid in dollars, including not only the cost of the vehicle but the the three hundred percent duty is also in paid in dollars. And I would say just don't do it, <laughs> don't do it. It's not going to help us. Uh, and also we have a crisis because we we are having difficulty with making repayments of the loans that we have got. And that is a crisis because it doesn't go away, it stays with us. And also, in other words, dealing with things that are really creating problems for us at the moment. Uh, and the easy way to say, address them, and then go after, um, when, when you have identified them and address them, then we will get to a place where we can address the other 
long term, medium term issues that have been uh, giving us problems like low growth, uh, poverty, uh, uh, increasing with COVID, of course, uh, it's what I would expect. So you can address those things about economic growth, income distribution, and, re and re reducing the incidence of poverty. So I think that the first thing would be, as I said before, is to address those things that are bothering us at the moment and then set up uh, and have a program of reform. I don't think we can really discuss uh, a crisis, how to get out of crisis without an idea of reform. Change the things that we have been doing, uh, selectively if you like, uh, and, and set about it, how addressing those things. So there, my, my um, menu could be very different from yours. Actually, I'd be surprised if it is uh, universally accepted. It may not be. Uh, I'm, I'm used to those circumstances. So I think that we will, if you start with the trade side, something I little, know a little bit about, I would say I look at the incentive structure, particularly starting with the trade. We have a higher um, tariff rates compared to uh, our, our uh, competition, compared to our neighborhood also. Uh, say we compare ourselves with uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, India, and um, say Pakistan. Uh, we, because we also have this, still we continue to have uh, these uh, paratides, which raises the uh, sort of a pro, uh, published inter, uh, tariff rate or loan percent to up to like 53% with the additions that come on. And that's too much. That's, the, that's the sort of average in the neighborhood is something like 22%. So if you go to 53%, we are not, um, we are not competitive. That's what the one reason why our uh, exports are not doing so well. And we have to continue with the situation where our imports are three times our exports and it is more, no longer an incentive problem, it becomes a macroeconomic problem that we'll be talking about later, I, I, I suppose. So uh, they address that issue. You know, remove the uh, barriers against exports. In uh, 2010, I was participant of a... Uh, of a project that uh, looked at the, uh, the opportunity to export uh, that was conducted by the Center for Economic, um, Center for Trade from Geneva. And there you see the people, there were 500 uh, enterprises were, uh, uh, um, were went and got them surveyed. And in the survey, 70% of them said, our problems are not outside. It's our problems are getting our goods from where we produce it to the border and the, and, and, and the internal to this country, 70% of them said. Various uh, barriers are put in, uh, various uh, requirements, uh, some, if you like, um, illegal payments made at the customs and things make our cost higher compared to other competitors. So today, our competitors are all over the world, not only our neighborhood, but beyond the neighborhood. And it's a much more competitive world than say about 15, 20 years ago, it will be more competitive. Then there are these new production networks that, um, that make it even more competitive where even slight differences in cost can make a big, big difference in, in the outcome. So then the question is, so what are we going to do? Uh, so as I started, the, go with the trade reform, uh, go with the uh, regulation reform. We have no sort of a uh, for example, we don't have any competition policy after 2003. We have a more like a consumer protection uh, 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 arrangement. We, it, we need the, the, the competition policy to address the issue of uh, what I call non tradable goods. Because, you know, uh, reducing tariffs and liberalizing the economy allows you to have competition from the rest of the world, which uh, will help us to uh, be strong and to be able to compete with the rest of the world. Uh, but for non-tradable, there is no such uh, a measure available to us. And, and we have to think about ways of increasing uh, competition in order to participate in the international um, division of labor and be more successful than we have been in the past. Um, so I think that in because of, of COVID and because we have not been doing having good growth, we are having the great now uh, more difficulties with uh, re 
reducing poverty. So we have a sort of welfare program like Samudhi. Somebody, people might not call it a welfare program, but yeah, it is a welfare program in some sort. And there are people who are outside that, unfortunately, many of them. And we have to really go and find the means in order to reach them and to give them the relief. For example, today, uh, people who are working daily jobs, like somebody who will sell his labor uh, to, for a day for like in Palamu, 2,500 rupees, something like that. Uh, there are no requests now because of lockdowns and things like that, which the government had to do. I, I understand that. And so we had to have a way of reaching people who are outside that thing, whereas uh, uh, some of them. And then, uh, uh, I, uh, so I, I will say, for example, we have a problem of, of crisis because we have a debt overhang, high debt overhang. We, we, don't, we are not having enough resources to repay the debt that we have uh, got over the years. Uh, we have long-term debt. Um, and and actually, it's not a debt problem in the sense. Uh, it's a debt repayment problem because there's nothing wrong with borrowing if you can invest it in areas where you give a rate of return. I think in a various places, I have said Holland, you know, the United States, when it's during a growth phase before the, uh, uh, I think before the revolution, even I think maybe after the revolution, if we stand corrected, borrowed from Holland and we paid it. And uh, so it's, it's a debt repayment problem, not rather than debt. Nothing, nothing wrong with debt. Uh, if we know how to uh, invest it and if we are allowed to uh, borrow from uh, either internally or from foreign stores, uh, if we return it in areas that are uh, that give a return, good return, so we can pay the debt as well as uh, increase the income out of it. Now that applies to a country also. Now in the case of uh, debt repayment, it, the, the, the output that we produce must be in tradable goods because non-tradables will not help you uh, to uh, repay because nobody accepts the Lankan rupee. There are cases where, you know, some countries which, are, which have uh, their own currency as a universal currency uh, can run into um, debt. debt and they can pay it. And for example, when the United States uh, can borrow from the rest of the world very easily because the more, the more currency created up to a point, of course, uh, it makes it the adjustment easy. So I will just say then the three things. I, I didn't, uh, what, one I said, address the things that are bothering us now, look to the future and say about the reform. Third, I just want to say the last thing is that we have to, we can't ignore the long term. We, we, are, we are in this point also because we did not think about the long term. It is true that Keynes said uh, it may probably be common, all of us are dead in the long run. But actually before that, there are two or three or four short runs or medium term runs where you, you, you have to look after your way, self look at, have a good policies to get to that uh, long term growth rate. So we have to think about restructuring uh, policies. Uh, things that will get a higher return for the public and private sectors. Uh, look at things that are not giving a lot of help to the country in terms of productivity. I'm thinking of state-owned enterprises on the one hand. I'm thinking about uh, uh, opportunities that are barriers that are there for people to uh, invest privately. I'm also thinking about the uh, reception to uh, for indirect investment, which is a sort of non-creating debt, the ideal to have at this time. But recording still, in progress. Yeah, that, but we are still, uh, you know, we, we haven't really exploited that for some, one reason or another. We can discuss that why it is so. I think I am. I have. I. I, I think I'm. I'm. I'll conclude now. Uh, I, maybe I've gone over 15 minutes, and I apologize for that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana, for that uh, very, very interesting uh, outlook as to what, what problems we have uh, been facing. And uh, if I may, just in a few sentences, sum up what you said, there's a growth issue and there are issues that we have topped up uh, by our own action. And there is a debt overhang, which are the kind of reflections of our, our issues. Now, the, the, the causes are, you know, we have not uh, entertained required reforms, 
and uh, we have not promoted our exports and we have not removed the bottlenecks for exports and also there is no competition policy in sri lanka we are only pr protecting uh, uh, consumer protection and also uh, we have not gone into the necessary restructuring in 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 in, in growth promotion activities so if i uh, am to sum up those things maybe uh, we can uh, uh, add anything more if you want to say sir in the in the discussion we can we can go ahead uh, thank you very much once again for your uh, uh, very insightful presentation and let's go to the second presenter now uh, dr asanka vijay singha uh, i think uh, you know you can probably touch upon anything that uh, that can be uh, probably uh, connected uh, to continue the flow and uh, you can uh, uh, continue with your presentation flow is yours thank you very much professor gunnuran uh, i i think i can share this screen uh can you yes see we see the screen, screen. yes we see yeah. the screen okay so i'm uh, thank you jesing i will uh, talk about uh, uh, the dimensions of the crisis i have not organized the way uh, professor gunogran uh, mentioned but uh, i will make sure that uh, it is uh, online and it will uh, not go beyond uh, the theme of uh, the webinar uh, i work as a research economist at uh, the uh, institute of uh, policy studies okay it's, uh, i think you you have had a wonderful uh, week uh, tomorrow and uh, uh, the day after tomorrow is a holiday for almost all of us so we were waiting for the friday afternoon i i am not sure whether this kind of webinar is a good thing for uh, friday afternoon so let's make it uh, more pleasantable as much as possible uh i will shut up because some people have to work in the weekend so there is a cartoon actually uh you can see president has a lot of reports in front of him ips state of the economy at the kedra institute to uh, webinar report but find that advice imf confidential report and there are many other uh, economic uh, plans in front of him so i think this webinar will add another thing for the president to consider the, for the policy makers uh, the outline is actually i will talk about this uh, evolution of our economy and what are the uh, uh, root causes of uh, the crisis and uh, then i will uh, talk about uh, the uh, trade outlook and uh, what are the challenges uh, we are having currently finally uh, uh, i will uh, discuss about uh, the opportunities we have or strategies we can use to overcome uh, this uh, crisis uh, for some numbers if you look at uh, the gdp growth of the country from uh, the historical perspective yes we are seeing uh, robust growth uh, until uh, 2019 uh, you can see uh, both gdp uh, and uh, the gdp per capita uh, is uh, facing a, a downturn due to covid uh, so it is a one dimension of this uh, crisis uh, our gdp uh, experienced a, a contraction in 2020 uh this uh, figure shows uh, the importance of the structural transformation especially after 1977's uh, economic liberalization you can uh, see that uh, our economy uh, grew uh, as a service economy after 1977 and more importantly agriculture contribution uh, started to decline however uh, this uh, structural transformation is more visible in uh, the, our export basket initially uh, we were exporting uh, food and agricultural products but after 1977's economic liberalization our export basket uh, is uh, dominated by uh, manufacturing products especially these uh, apparel products but the problem is that if you consider about the labor force is still a quarter of the labor force is in the agriculture sector it is about 25% if you compare uh, it with uh, the contribution uh, to uh, the gdp agriculture's contribution in 2019 is about 
Uh, so these are uh, some uh, salient uh, features of our economy. Uh, apparel industry uh, mostly dominate our export basket and uh, quite of uh, the labor force is in uh, the uh, agricultural sector. And another important thing is our informal sector is pretty large, about 41% is uh, self-employed. If if you look at the effect of the crisis we need, we cannot forget this informal uh, sector uh, because they were the most affected by the economic downturn, especially the loss of livelihood due to the mobility restrictions. So we have a crisis, we are experiencing an economic downturn and it is, it's, its effect is disproportionate. Uh, it is more uh, concentrated upon uh, the informal sector workers. Uh, let's look at uh, uh, our trade and growth models we have followed. Actually, we don't see much consistency historically. Uh, you can read, uh, of course, Professor Rajapati Ramis writings and also uh, Dr. Kalegama had has extensive uh, amount of uh, papers about these uh, categorizations of our growth models. Uh, post-liberalization period uh, before 1977, we can categorize uh, as non-interventionist and interventionist period. Uh, these are not monolithic uh, policy regimes. Uh, certain years, uh, they change the policies due to uh, the uh, external shocks. Uh, and post-liberalization area, the most important, uh, I think, period is the non-credible sector growth between 2005 and 2015, uh, especially after the uh, uh, end of uh, war. We, uh, I will uh, show that uh, in future slides. So the globally, uh, we are seeing, we, we were seeing actually a trend uh, that uh, demand uh, to go backward or uh, to increase the inward looking uh, uh, policy initiatives uh, in the worldwide too, actually. It was uh, especially uh, came to prominence after Brexit and uh, Trump's uh, election in 2016. And this slow growth of manufacturing jobs, the uh, wage effect in uh, US, uh, they were mostly blamed for uh, Chinese import competition. Uh, there is this uh, extensive uh, literature. If you look at the, the electoral map in 2016, President Trump, he uh, capitalized on this growing unrest of the manufacturing workers in uh, the Rust Belt area. So you can see this deep red, we call it as Rust Belt <coughs> in the US. But the problem is, is there a deglobalization. I'm asking this question because we are seeing this inward looking trend in Sri Lanka. There may be a quite different <laughs> justifications. One thing is that, okay, someone can argue globally, we are seeing a deglobalization. We are seeing that uh, the developed countries are ensuring they are uh, manufacturing back to their countries. Uh, is there such deglobalization? Uh, we can we justify you know, looking uh, uh, trade policies in Sri Lanka using that argument? So let's look at some uh, stats. So this left-hand side panel is uh, the GDP to trade ratio globally. You can see that uh, around uh, 2008, you, we, we see a deep uh, plunge this was due to the global financial crisis. Yeah. But between 1986 to 2008, there was a robust growth. Uh, economists like Paul Antras, he called this era as the golden era of globalization. So the important thing is, even though around 2009, we saw a plunge, the trend reverted back to the long-term average. And we aftermath, we are seeing some kind of stabilization of the GDP, the trade to GDP ratio in the world. So what economists are saying is that we are not seeing a deglobalization instead of we are 
seen as globalization, kind of slowdown of uh, the uh, trade uh, growth. But if you look at the right, right hand side panel, actually the, the blue line is Sri Lanka's trade openness. You can see that after 2000, around 2005, uh, our openness was going down and uh, regionally the other countries' openness was uh, going up, especially the countries like uh, Bangladesh, India, uh, especially Bangladesh and India. Uh, uh, the reason behind this uh, decline of our openness uh, was, I think, uh, post-war infrastructure development that non-credible sectors growth, uh, it contributed uh, to the GDP. So GDP growth was uh, higher, but our uh, trade, especially exports, uh, they were, were not uh, growing uh, at a steady or robust phase. So, we are following kind of inward looking uh, trade policies, but uh, in the world, we are not seeing uh, any evidence for uh, deglobalization and our regional partners are increasing our trade, increasing their trade openness. Uh, so uh, what is the uh, prospectus, prospects of a V-shaped uh, recovery for Sri Lanka? We are almost uh, talking about uh, whether uh, V-shaped uh, economic recovery is uh, possible. Uh, Pandemic-induced contraction in 2020, it was about minus 3.6. And uh, we can reasonably expect that uh, the economy will uh, bounce back, bounce back uh, in uh, 2021 to pre-pandemic level, uh, pre-pandemic output. But the problem is we need to grow from that point on. And another challenge is actually Pre-pandemic growth rate was also not much higher. Uh, it was a, a, we had a lower base, so we are calculating these growth rates uh, related to that uh, low base. We need to achieve higher growth. Uh, forecast for Sri Lanka is uh, kind of uh, fluctuating about 3.3 3 to 4. According to our SOE report, if we manage to get a 4%, 4 percentage uh, growth rate this year, we can uh, bounce back to uh, the pre-pandemic level. So the challenge is to grow from uh, that point. Uh, if you look at the trade statistics, trade actually recovered uh, faster than the predictions. This is the global trade uh, growth. Uh, I calculated this using uh, the uh, uh, this, uh, this is a new database. Uh, there are these ships emit signals. Uh, we call these as port call signals. So I call, they, an IMF team analyzed uh, these port calls and uh, they found that uh, trade recovered uh, uh, at uh, the beginning of 2021 in the world. Uh, not only the, the uh, food stuff and other bulk uh, trade, but also vehicles. Vehicles is a prototypical example for global value chain uh, participation. Uh, though uh, initially it uh, suffered setback, uh, the industry uh, robustly adapted to the situation and uh, they increased uh, their uh, trade. Uh, about uh, Sri Lanka, the, the world, uh, WTO's prediction about global outlook is favorable. Actually, they, uh, uh, in October, they revised their March uh, predictions. They uh, expect uh, the trade growth will be about 10.8% this year. And in 2022, 4.7%. Uh, so it is a good thing for Sri Lanka. That means that the global demand will be substantial if our policy environment, and if we have a good incentive system, we can capitalize on this global uh, development. Uh, so far, up to uh, August, according to CBSL uh, data, our exports was about 7.9 billion this year, uh, but in 2019, it was about, up to August, it was about eight. So we are kind of, having a similar trade uh, as in uh, 2019. Uh, 
ADB predicted about 10% growth compared to 2020. That means about 1 billion uh, growth. It will uh, bring our exports this year to 11 billion mark. I think EDB, Export Development Board, is expecting 12 billion uh, exports uh, this year. It is not too much of an uh, ambitious target. It is a feasible uh, target if this uh, uh, export, uh, I think uh, currently we are recording about 1 billion uh, trade uh, monthly, if we continue that for the coming uh, four months. Uh, here, the economy-wide challenges, as I said, uh, we are comparing these uh, statistics uh, compared to uh, the 2019, it's a far below uh, growth performance, even before uh, the COVID-19. Uh, so if you need to achieve a robust increase in economic uh, activities and uh, lift the current trend, and having have a higher growth rate, we need to uh, make sure, especially trade aspect, uh, we export more and we remove uh, the uh, constraints uh, for that uh, trade. Uh, if there will be reduced growth, uh, I'm talking about this because uh, of the current uh, fertilizer and agrochemical ban. There is this very nice uh, journal article published about a month ago in Journal of Political Economy by the Oxford economist, uh, Professor Golly, they found that this Green Revolution Pact, we call this uh, as Green Revolution uh, because it uh, intensified uh, the agriculture, uh, high input use and high agrochemical use. It favorably affected, positively affected the country's GDP. Uh, and uh, we can plausibly uh, expect that if our yield will go down and if uh, one quarter of the labor force will be affected by this fertilizer uh, ban, our economy will face a contraction, at least a reduced growth. If there will be a reduced growth, uh, we may not be able to invest in our vital sectors like education and health. That's really important for our uh, human uh, capital development. Uh, we in a study estimated the pu public sector education expenditure efficiency. That means uh, for a uh, given level of output, what is the amount of uh, investment we can contract without affecting the existing level of output. If you look at this uh, uh, graph, you can see that Sri Lanka education sector compared to its expenditure it's highly efficient. It's about 93% efficient. That means there is just 7% chance to contract the budget. That means there is no uh, much window to contract the budget. If there will be an economic contraction, we will have to sacrifice our uh, education and, uh, and health. You can see health also, we are having uh, this kind of uh, high uh, efficiency. So we will have to sacrifice the output. They will uh, bring us long-term ramifications uh, to the country. Uh, the trade sector, uh, the important policy change, uh, even before uh, the uh, COVID-19, actually this turmeric and spices, they were banned, uh, they were temporarily suspended around 2019 uh, December. Uh, there was this in not looking uh, uh, trade policy and it was accelerated after this uh, crisis. We have calculated uh, currently about 4.1% of capital goods, 16.24% of intermediate goods and 10% of uh, consumption goods are under some sort of import control. So, so they can be like uh, import control license, temporary suspension, credit basis requirements. Uh, it is a, well, the overall, uh, according to 2017 import values, about 31% of imports are under some sort of import controls. As a country, Sri Lanka is importing uh, more intermediate goods. Uh, so this, I, I don't need to explain that uh, the 
bad effect of uh, control in intermediate uh, imports. Uh, another challenge is there is this GSP plus uncertainty. I, wo I want to uh, mention this, our regional trade integration attempts are also ineffective. This is a recent gravity estimation we did. Uh, you can uh, see that uh, the effect of regional trade agreements in all sectors, agriculture, food, textiles, total, uh, the effect is either uh, negative or uh, trivial, uh, that is statistically not significant. Even in food sector, this is statistically negative. So how can a, re a regional trade agreement can, have, can give you negative effects? They may be due to rule of origins, uh, different uh, uh, technical barriers. Uh, you know, there are general regulatory barriers. I'm not saying the regional trade agreements are bad. I'm saying the regional trade, trade agreements, what we are having with uh, the regional countries, uh, they, they are not much effective for our uh, export uh, growth. So opportunities, uh, in the questions also, I will uh, discuss about that. Uh, one thing is US uh, supply chain realignment. Uh, we can uh, capitalize on that. The Biden administration is trying to realign the supply chains away from uh, China, especially these uh, semiconductors and critical minerals like graphite. So we, we have a chance that we can capitalize that on that. Another thing is that the tram tariff still exists. So there is a chance that trade will be diverted from uh, China to Sri Lanka especially in textiles. There is this recent paper uh, by Anushka, Vijayasiri uh, and Anushka Vijayasinghe. They found that uh, <coughs> I had to uh, capitalize on this uh, trade diversion, but it is an opportunity Sri Lanka is having. Uh, we are having successful action rollout, so we have opportunity to open the economy smoothly. Now, finally, what I want to uh, emphasize is that free trade and green revolution increased nation's welfare. Uh, if you try to give up both of these all together uh, simultaneously, the, uh, it will uh, challenge us and uh, uh, the effects will be uh, substantial for the uh, country. Thank you very much. I think uh, yeah, I, I took about five minutes. And sorry about that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay Singha. It was a very uh, a pedagogical uh, kind of research-oriented presentation, which enlightened us uh, uh, into many kind of uh, dimensions of the crisis. I'm particularly touched with your uh, remark uh, uh, about the, not only the uh, growth perspective, but also your analysis on the RTAs. Uh, you say that, uh, that those have been ineffective. And you say that those are not necessarily bad, but they are, the way that we may have done it, it is ineffective. I think uh, uh, I would go one step further saying that they are bad. So let's have the discussion uh, uh, later on, on those things. Uh, well, uh, without taking uh, uh, any more time, let's get on to uh, uh, Dr. Priyanka Dunusingha. Uh, he's from uh, my own university, University of Colombo. So, uh, uh, Dr. Dunusingha is, uh, uh, is also a good researcher and a good uh, policy advoc advocate these days. You see him in uh, newspapers and uh, uh, other things. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dhanu Singha, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, sir. And uh, as the last man of a match, I think I can hit here and there <laughs> without thinking much. Either you get success or <laughs> you get out. You don't need to worry. Uh, and already, uh, I think the good speakers already mentioned what I had, uh, I mean, what I thought of uh, speaking. So I have uh, what you call the incremental uh, addition that I have to do uh, is limited. Of having uh, said that, I would like to uh, basically share some of my thoughts, uh, which in fact I shared uh, way back in 2016 at uh, one of the uh, uh, annual conference of uh, Sri Lanka Economic Association. There I discuss about the key bottlenecks to sustain economic growth in Sri Lanka. Uh, 
to the lens of uh, three gap three gap analysis. So I would like to uh, share some of the thoughts or some of the findings of that work with you as I see uh, uh, those findings are very much relevant in the con in today's context in understanding uh, what has uh, what has gone wrong so uh, even though you you may see some of the things uh, some of the outcomes uh, in the context of the pandemic uh, which are more visible now uh, but certainly those who were behind the uh, scene which basically prevented Sri Lanka uh, recording a, a sustainable or uh, having a sustainable growth path. Without addressing those, it is really difficult even in the post pandemic situation uh, Sri Lanka to get ahead and uh, go for a uh, sustain economic growth. So I think uh, because of its relevance, I thought of uh, discussing the same output or same thing uh, in uh, today's session as well. Now, without uh, getting much into uh, uh, you know objective and all these things of a paper, because this is, that paper is not intended for this particular. Uh, uh, session. If you look at the structural transformation, I think as we know, structural transformation is uh, one of the key factor behind the growth process, growth and the development process. What does it mean by the structural transformation? It is about moving factors of production from low productive utilization to high productive utilization. That is about the structural transformation. Maybe in maybe the factors may be in agriculture sector or maybe in the industrial sector or in the services sector. No matter what is important in the structural transformation, we need to move factors of production from low productive to high productive areas that guarantee that we receive higher productivity with respect to factors of production. That is what, what is needed. But in the context of Sri Lanka, you see that you know, share of agriculture has declined over the years. And in fact, in some years, artificially, dropped down, for example, from 2002 to 2003, all of a sudden decline. But in fact, whether it is a kind of a shift that we expect in the theory of economic is a matter of you know, concern. But what you could see with respect to uh, industry, uh, share, of, uh, share of output in the industry remain more or less same since 80s. I mean, this itself reflect that we have even though we say that you know uh, uh, our export led uh, growth process uh, manufacturing led growth process we have failed to generate that in the uh, during the uh, post liberalization period even in the agriculture sector true some of the uh, inputs uh, shifted to other sectors, but within each of these sectors, services, industry, as well as the uh, agriculture, still resources are uh, what we call the trap in low productive areas due to number of reasons. So in true sense, we don't see a, a structural transformation in, in, in our economy. I don't deny that uh, some level of structural transformation is there, but uh, still the productive resources are trapped in low productive areas in all the three sectors. Required reforms as 
Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana correctly mentioned are missing as a result, we let resources to trap in those low productive areas. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we have failed in generating a sustained growth. This is one of the area that Sri Lanka must concentrate and require reforms in the labor market, in the land uh, reforms, in, in with respect to other areas are not happening. A lot of promises are there, but uh, we don't see uh, such reforms are uh, taken place. And as a result, uh, resources still keep trap. I think that is one of the uh, key concerns that we need to address. And the, one of the other element, which is very important, and now I have here, as I mentioned, I presented this in 2016, so I have used data from 15 to 2015, 50, 1950 to 2015. And here we have, I have, uh, I have graphed the uh, economic growth rate and uh, the HP filtered growth rate. Uh, when you could see that this red line, what you can witness, uh, if, at the, I mean, every time you get the growth rate high, then, that is followed with the uh, decline. This is called the self-killing growth rate. Now, Sri Lanka inherits a self-killing growth rate. The growth rate itself, growth process itself inherit some of the elements that can kill it. That is, the I think, one of the challenge before us, how to, uh, I think, how, how to uh, basically manage this, how to uh, how to address this issue, why go growth get killed in by itself is something that we need to address. I think uh, in subsequent section, I will explain why it get killed by itself. And this, I actually, in fact, I gave the name of this called the Kala Sarpa Yogi. Uh, in <laughs> singular, uh, Kala Sarpa Yogi means that you cannot complete the cycle. You cannot complete it. You get uh, half the way, you get uh, it uh, constrained. So these constraints will be explained, uh, three constraints, in fact, I will explain. So this is one of the fundamental issue, no matter the issues uh, with respect to other areas, but um, I think it, if not we address this uh, fundamental issue of, issue of uh, growth process, get killed in itself, I think uh, we are not able to sustain the growth process. That, that is what happened. Now, we discussed in 2012 and 2011, uh, sorry, 2010, 11, we recorded a growth rate of 8, 9%. And many predicted that we have done a kind of a paradigm shift with respect to the growth process. We are, we have uh, in fact, I mean, uh, we have, in fact, uh, get into a, uh, get into a uh, completely a different growth path. But what, what we experienced since 2012 onwards, we started experiencing declining growth. So that means uh, without addressing these fundamentals, you can pump money, you can borrow loans and carry out public expenditure, various projects, but that, it, that could, you know, artificially increase the GDP in one or two years, but the level effect and the growth effect are two different things. I think that is what we do not, what many of us do not understand. You can increase the GDP, but in order to keep the growth rate at a higher level, you need certain elements that are very much fundamental to the uh, economic growth in terms of technological improvement, in terms of productivity improvements, you know, in terms of innovations. There are things that we need to uh, we need to have in order to sustain a growth path, not the uh, the level effect. 
then uh, getting into the uh, one of the uh, theoretical framework behind the work that i done in way back in 2016 we started with the two gap model i am sure dr uh, sarat uh, rajapatirame is well aware of this uh, two gap model and uh, very much discussing various forum i have attended and uh, as we know in developing countries we say uh, there is a gap with respect to savings and investment domestic savings and investment as well as with respect to foreign exchange earnings and expenditure basically imports and ex imports and export generally i mean in general sense now this particular model was employed in explaining uh, some of the constraint faced by developing countries in achieving uh, the develop uh, achieving the economic growth because uh, the developing countries face uh, these two gaps uh, two gaps one uh, in the domestic economy and other with respect to respect to the external economy the growth process are constrained by these factors additionally in recent years uh, not as such recent as such but the third dimension was uh, introduced in terms of the fiscal gap basically the gap between the uh, the fiscal uh, the what you call the expenditure and the uh, uh, revenue now in in this in in the in the theoretical uh, context this uh, public investment is considered now generally in when we learn economic theory uh, in particular the macroeconomics when we learn we discuss about the crowding out effect crowding out effect where when the government increase expenditure it crowd out the private investments but when it comes to public investment in particular it is now we call that crowding in effect crowding in effect in the sense in fact that public investment encourage or complement the private investment so in that context public investment is an essential component in the growth process because that encourage private investments generally in the context of sri lanka public investment engage in large scale you know uh, the investment activities or investment the projects such as infrastructure and other related area those investment could generate some uh, generate private investments so if the if we uh, do not if the govern if the government is or the if a country is not in a position to increase the public investment it is also one of the uh, bottlenecks for the sustained growth because it cannot uh, it cannot uh, basically uh, create an environment which is conducive for the public uh, invest uh, private investors to invest so this this particular position is backed by number of uh, models such as the big push theory oring theory no growth model of david roma and coordination failures theory number of theories have highlighted the complementary nature of public investments where the public investment is necessary in certain areas uh, in order to generate sufficient amount of private investments so in that respect if there is a gap with respect to the uh if if we if a country faces a fiscal gap that could uh, basically uh work as a uh, uh what we call the bottlenecks for uh, sustained growth so within this framework i actually did a uh, kind of a empirical analysis i am not going to discuss these things but only i will summarize the results here 
uh, by looking at the uh, when when we if I summarize the results generally, what we have seen that foreign exchange gap and fiscal gap uh, shifted downward, indicating over the years those were cast binding constraints. In the con in the context of Sri Lanka, this foreign exchange gap and the fiscal gap actually uh, have been or have worked as a constraint. Uh, the major constraint for uh, the uh, growth process. That is, uh, out of the two gap, fiscal gap became the most stringent binding constraint. So now we may argue, now one we say that this is uh, about the dollar issue. Lack of dollar is uh, the major problem. Some, some aim at, uh, some, some try to, try to, uh, uh, try to argue. And on that basis, uh, argue that we need more foreign investment, we need more exports, we need uh, more foreign remittances, and on that basis, one may argue. And uh, some may argue that we have actually the problem is, yes, partly with the foreign exchange, but more with the, the fiscal gap, where government, uh, there is a gap between the revenue and expenditure. So we need to fill this or we need to close this in order to uh, avoid foreign borrowings and avoid you know, uh, some other issues. Now, if you reflect the current context through the lens of these theoretical models, it is very clear that we certainly agree there is a problem with the uh, ex with, with our foreign exchange. But at the same time, if you look at why we now face the foreign exchange or the lack of reserve, foreign reserve at the moment, we pay higher amount for debts. Why? Government has borrowed. Why? In order to fill the gap. Because there is a gap between the revenue and expenditure. So successive governments have not addressed the particular problem problem of this fiscal gap. As a result, we have gone on borrowing first ODA at concessionary level. Next, from 2007 onwards, getting into the international markets. Now the central bank is blaming for the Moody of downgrading. But at the time that we went to the went to international market, we I mean we, we know that there are credit rating agencies, they are free to rate the country and they are free to issue statement with respect to the credit worthiness. Now one can, you know, uh, one can argue this is bias and governance is in good safe, okay, because we have a strong political ship, political leadership, various things you can see. But at the time that you decided to go in 2007 to the international, uh, international market to borrow, you know that ratings matter. You cannot just simply, you know, simply blame those rating, rating agencies. This is nonsense, to be frank. Okay, I saw that uh, how can the Moody say governance is weak, we have a strong political leadership. Central bank has missed what is meant by the governance. So I think these, these are some of the things that we need to address. So certainly the fiscal consolidation is one of the key area for consideration. That is where that previous government, in fact, took certain measures. In fact, some of the, what we call the lobbyist groups work behind the government and tried to get, tried, I mean, they, they, they did certain uh, intervention in order to reverse some of the good tax policies introduced by the previous government, in particular the pay tax, I must say, even though I get penalized with that 
text, I must say that it is something that uh, was a very good proposal, uh, but uh, some interested groups work very hard to get it reversed. And revenue consolidation is one of the key component. And at the same time, expenditure cut or expenditure reduction is one of the key requirements. In particular, the state-owned enterprises play a key role. I mean, uh, state-owned enterprise, how, how we reform the state-owned enterprises is one thing that we need to seriously consider if you want to address this fiscal gap. The other one is that basically how to uh, fill the foreign exchange gap. These two gaps are very much uh, from the cornerstone of today's problem. You may see that high debt, we have to pay 10,000 uh, millions by July, to, uh, July 25th of uh, next year. You can say this and that. But why we have, why we finally, uh, why we finally uh, uh, had to borrow such amount because of the fiscal gap. So without addressing it, I don't think that there is there are shortcuts. Similarly, with respect to the export, is also the same. And in addition, I will like to uh, identify uh, few uh, at least three gaps that I see in today's context. One is the institutional gap. Exist, existing institutional structure do not support market fundamentals. Very clear. You expect foreign direct investors to come in, but what are the signals? What are the incentives that you give? Are those incentives are sufficient to generate not the foreign investment, but even the local investment? I don't think so. So unless you provide right incentives, right institutions, institutional structures, I don't think that the country can get the required investments to pave the way for a higher growth path. The existing business environment is very weak. You may see various you know, ups and downs in the stock market. Don't judge on the basis of the stock, stock, market, stock market movements. Those are all uh, organized activities at a particular club. Okay, so there are, if you look at the incentive structure, were, I mean, written as well as unwritten incentive structure right now in the economy, it is really, really adverse or negative. We need to make sure that we have inclusive institutions. Some of the steps were taken in the previous regimes towards this inclusive institutions by introducing certain, uh, cer certain uh, amendments. But what we have seen, reversal. In such a setup, uh, it is highly doubtful whether you get the required investment. Second one is entrepreneurship gap. I think this is one of the fundamental issue again that goes beyond the, the gaps that we discuss way back to 1977. When we opened the economy, we thought that entrepreneurship is a kind of a natural uh, outcome of the market competition. That was the belief held by the policymakers at the time of uh, liberalization. But in the context of Sri Lanka, I don't know whether it is historically inherited uh, cultural context. I put I have put here the Rajakarya type mentality. <laughs> we are very much uh, towards the Rajakarya type uh, performance where we like to be employees rather than employers. I don't know whether that has influence to some extent, but we need to agree that level of entrepreneurship remain very, very low. 
there are buying and selling you know merchants uh, engaging in various activities but uh, we have failed over the years to generate enough for the uh, the entrepreneurship in particular young men talent people engage in uh, entrepreneurship activities are very much limited maybe in the in the field of industry in the field of agriculture in the field of services partly this is because of the incentives that we have given because one can easily make money by buying and selling type activities so you have created a created a, an environment which uh, discourage again some of the young to get into entrepreneurship but we have not launched uh, sustain no uh, very comprehensive programs in order to enhance the entrepreneurship across uh, across the uh, the sectors and this is one of the reason why we now uh, see that our export remain low uh, and all these things we discuss because uh, the fundamental reason behind that may be the lack of entrepreneurship and the last one i this is what i actually wanted to focus but uh, finally i changed my topic but human resource gap i think at the moment uh, we are this is a, a current crisis with the with the pandemic with the way that the govern uh, the country is heading right now uh, in not just now but in recent years i must say uh, many uh are uh, feeling that they don't have a future in this country this is a serious matter we need to pay attention if not what i always say nuts will remain in the country all the good product will go out so as a vicious circle will start vicious circle will start it is like capital moving from periphery to the center the human resources flow from sri lanka to the center center in the sense the western countries will go on and as a result the fundamental factors which are essential for economic growth and development will be missing in sri lanka and uh, it will uh, be a, a really difficult no matter who are the the i mean who will come to the power it will be really be a uh, difficult task uh, for us to get the resources organized for economic growth and development with that thank you so much thank you very much uh, dr dhunu singha for that very elaborate presentation uh, um, i don't have to sum up your presentation because you yourself have made it very clear uh, that you have gone into self healing yourself so uh, you have also uh, talk, you are talking about uh, crowding in effect uh, well uh, there are there may be uh, different opinions on that kind of a story and also you mentioned the fiscal gap as the most important of the two gaps and uh, finally you are talking about uh, the the labor the human resource gap which you predict as a uh, kind of a, a kendra karya you are saying that that's going to be the biggest gap that you you have in going to be facing in the future and nuts will remain in the country we are all nuts that's why we are here so including you we all are nuts already so um, that your presentation is very elaborate thank you very much for your presentation let me open the floor for discussion now uh, if uh, any uh, of the participants or uh, uh, you, you yourself want to intervene and 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 exchange it is the time and i would invite uh, uh, the participants to even raise questions in singhalese it's okay 
uh, because this can be made a bilingual discussion from now on. Uh, uh, anyone wants to raise any questions, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Uh, um, you can you can raise your hand up and uh, uh, get the mic for you, or you can uh, uh, send a message through chat box. Floor is yours. Dr. Dilini, uh, you can also manage if there are speakers to uh, uh, intervene and say things. We are already, uh, I think, uh, past our deadline, but no matter, we can go another, say, half an hour. Uh, if everyone is willing to, we can, because the discussion is going to be interesting. I invite all of you to stay. Okay, can I uh, basically add a com uh, comment? I'm Shashi from the Columbia yes, University. Yes, 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 please. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for all the wonderful presentations. I won't take time, but just, just want to make a comment on what uh, Dr. Dulu Singh pointed out about uh, entrepreneurial, uh, you know, um, um how to develop the the entrepreneurial abilities of the you know our students and then uh, of course our people human resource and this is actually um thinking of long term where we really have to uh, you know uh, have independence for our students and our school children um to come up with uh, you know innovations and creations and come up with the own product so that uh, we can be um, you know uh, export since they have the abilities but then there is no uh, sort of um, support from the from us uh, uh, curricula and um, so um, i at this point i think um, that's a uh, that's something we really have to ponder about developing uh, entrepreneurial skills of our own products and then uh, come up, uh, you know, overcome most of the problems in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Shashi. Uh, I see Dr. Hemasiri Kotagama, Professor Hemasiri Kotagama is uh, willing to intervene. Uh, uh, I hope, I, I don't know whether you are in Sri Lanka or still in the Middle East, wherever you are, you're most welcome. Please ra uh, raise your voice. Good evening to all of you all. Uh, firstly, of course, to my friend, uh, the chairman of this session, Professor Lalit Siri Unarwan. Uh, Professor Lalit Siri, I wish to share a few opinions, not very deep, but as a layman. Actually, I got uh, attracted to the topic of this session, which is current economic crisis. Sorry to say, I did not hear much about the current economic crisis, but what I heard was mostly generalities of uh, economic crisis. So please excuse me for saying this, but like Professor Lalit Sashir Bunduan, I'm a forthright speaker. I express my mind clearly. <laughs> okay, so I will focus on one aspect of what is on your topic. You very rightly asked right at the beginning, are we in an economic crisis? Okay, if we had to answer that, we should be able to define what an economic crisis is, and preferably we should be able to measure it. Now, I did not hear any, any uh, definition or a description uh, of what an economic crisis is, uh, as well as a measurement. Is it a decline in the growth of GDP? For If so, there must be a time dimension. And for how long? Uh, is it that people miss uh, 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 a plate of rice a day? Is that what we mean by an economic crisis? So from one mundane uh, explanation of it, to a more objective explanation of it. We should know what it is. Otherwise, this is only a political explanation of what an economic crisis is, and the politicians make use of it. Now, Professor Larita Siri Bunurwan, if you look back at the screen, the background screen, you have a graph without the axis, but I believe this is, a, this is from the internet, which uh, explains economic uh, growth. 
So what you see there is what was explained by Dr. Dunasinghe and as well as Dr. Asanka. So what you see is that economic growth, it grows, and then it comes down, it grows, it comes down, it stagnates, and then it grows. So when you say about the economic crisis, we must have a time scale. I think what we are now is not in an economic crisis. It, we are in a dip. We are in a dip, and this dip cannot be explained only by all these past historical economic uh, economic variables. This is a very unusual situation of the COVID. So my my non-empirical analysis, therefore my personal opinion, is that is that Sri Lanka is not in an economic crisis that is defined. It is, it is in a dip, and a dip caused by a natural cause. And I believe, I believe and I wish that the resilience that Sri Lanka has shown always in the past, from the ancient kings up to recent times, we will be able to pick up. We had wars for 30 years, and we were able to pick up and so forth. Of course, we are in a low equilibrium trap in a sense. We, we are poor, but we have been able to sustain growth. Uh, Dr. Dunsinger's uh, uh, graph shows it. We have gone through erratic times. The line goes up and down, but the long term is a slow economic growth. That growth may not be sufficient, but whether we call that a crisis is a different thing. So I think uh, Professor Lalita Gusiri Gunarwan, my dear friend, if we are to address this issue, we must be very clear of what an economic crisis is. Is it a phenomenon of a single year? Or you have to have the temporal dimension in your measurement, uh, which I did not hear, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I wish I could hear it from the speakers. What is, what is meant by an economic crisis? What are the indicators through which we can measure it? What is the temporal dimension of it, is what I would like to hear. I'm going back to say the reason that I joined this was the interest on that economic crisis and current, uh, not generalities of why we are in this situation, taking long run reasons long into history. So the next is uh, we have learned few lessons during this challenge, I may call, not an economic crisis, economic challenge. And uh, those were mentioned by Dr. Asanka, particularly, uh, and also Dr. Dunasinghe and uh, Dr. Sarat. I think the main issue is a foreign exchange crisis, no other but a foreign exchange crisis. Uh, that, could, that could be explained through various, uh, that could be explained through historical reasons, but it is mostly due to COVID. It is mostly due to COVID. If I could put a number, I would say at least 90% of the reason is COVID. Uh, we lost our tourism. We lost remittance. Rem, rem, remittance. Rem, what is it, Dr. Right, Siri? The money that I sent to you? <laughs> remittances. <laughs> From Middle remittances. remittances. Uh, so all this. So uh, we got to identify it in that context, and we got to now address it in the very short term. How are we going to meet this challenge in the short term? Then the economy will slowly pace up in its own way. That's my opinion. But I have very many questions to ask. I should not take too much of time. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Gunavan, you are muted. Sorry, uh, sorry. Um, um, now you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, my good friend, Professor uh, uh, Hemasiri Kotagama. Uh, I agree with uh, some of uh, your, your remarks uh, uh, that we have not probably defined uh, whether there is a crisis or what the crisis is. But I, I don't probably agree with you when you say that uh, you, uh, the the, the the crisis has to be measured particularly uh, by way of uh, time horizon and, and by way of uh, 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 the perspective of short run and long run because there are certain growths which may be seen as short run, but it can be persisting as long run, like just like your and my hair, which, which have gone now for 
for, for a six and it is even short run or long run it will not come back you know so so there are certain things uh, that that reflects crisis uh, and and whether it is a deep or a crisis uh, can be can be uh, probably argued upon uh, let me list, uh, let me hear from uh, uh, our presenters also uh, uh, any 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 uh, comments to be made regarding uh, uh, professor hemsri kotagama's remark but i agree let me say from my side there is one important point he, he said it is an exchange crisis dr dusinga said it is a fiscal crisis now fiscal crisis has two parts of it government's fiscal deficit has a local uh, uh, part of it and a foreign part of it and the local part of it can be if the government wishes to address by uh, uh, fiscality fiscal revenue and other means and also by savings efficiency but the the, the exchange part of it the, the fiscal deficit derived from the imports part of it of the government's expenditure by way of uh, you know um, public expenditure spent out of dollars is a crisis i would say uh, there i think i agree fully with uh, professor m sri kotagama and that has to be addressed please i i, I would like to listen uh, uh, to from the uh, panel is uh, dr vijay singh wants to uh, or, or, or dr dhunu singh wants to or dr uh, rajapatira wants to intervene please yeah i uh, i would like to answer first uh, i think uh, certainly we i do not uh, deny uh, that uh, there is no foreign exchange uh, issue but uh, we have certainly a foreign exchange view uh, foreign exchange issue but uh, when i do my uh, empirical uh, investigation what i found was that uh, the fiscal gap is really uh, fiscal gap is uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, a constraint uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, somewhat Uh, binding the end uh, foreign exchange uh, gap But now the, the reason uh, is this if I, if I'm now have you segregated separated out the fiscal deficit arising out of public expenditure on projects and dollars and have you have you segregated it out that fiscal deficit arising out of rupee spending on recurrent expenditure and uh, salaries and all So yes. you say that the rupee part is more binding than the dollar part. Yeah. Dollar basically, uh, when it comes to foreign uh, public investment, when it come come to public investments, we know that uh, public investments you need uh, you heavily depend on the borrowing, in particular the uh, foreign borrowing. because in it to in it, it involve some sort of some amount of capital investment as well capital in, investment in the sense some uh, you know uh, imports of certain equipment certain technologies and related areas whereas the rupee borrowing you mostly uh, channel into the area of uh, current expenditure fill in the current expenditure so what we see now for example assume uh, at the moment uh, we have witness a decline in uh, exports a decline in uh, tourist earnings decline in other uh, you know foreign uh, remittances and all at the same time we know we have a, a commitment around 4.5 to 5 Uh, billion dollars per year for what we have borrowed we have borrowed in order to fill the fiscal gap yeah but that fiscal gap dr busing huh? we have been always in the current account there is no i mean uh, uh, if the government if you take the uh, uh, the capital budget part out generally the government revenue and government expenditure goes close by most of the time but what has no, happened was only in one recent year yeah i mean the, the, the primary the, the difference primary goes surplus. mostly the difference goes mostly uh, uh, with the with the capital budget coming up and heavily spending on capital investment 
and most of these capital investments are not as dr Raj, rajapati rana said most of these capital investment are not generating the dollars uh, required to pay the uh, settle the debt that's the crisis because recurrent gap you might be able to uh, uh, solve with uh, uh, local means yeah i mean uh, since i think somewhere in middle mid 1990s or oh, somewhere early 2000 i think sri lanka shifted to a great extent to the foreign borrowings uh, and in particular the short run foreign short run borrowings because we had uh, with the i mean when we get into the lower middle income country sri lanka lost uh, you know some some of, i mean sri lanka was not able to uh, get access to some of the uh, concessionary loans and as a result we had to go for a Uh, borrowing at a higher rate from the international market so we now we continued that and as a result uh, we go with the budget deficit and in order to fill the budget deficit we keep borrowing from abroad and that push that put the heavier burden uh, to the economy to the uh, growth process than the Uh, than the uh, lack of uh, foreign exchange foreign exchange actually it is not the good exports as such but services exports also get into the picture right now in addition to remittances and in addition to uh, you know other form of channels uh, certainly we agree that there is a uh, you know foreign exchange crisis or foreign lack of foreign exchange if i if i am to relate some statistics to you in 2017 Uh, the revenue of the government was 13.7% of the gdp and the recurrent expenditure was 14.5 so it's, it closely uh, follows i mean it's negative true but 13.7 and 14.5 and 2018 also it is 13.4 and 14.5 it is 2019 it is a different story altogether because it it has gone into hay wire maybe because of elections and other other kind of things and the and i 2019 uh, pass kuirida whatever i don't know but 2019 to 12.6 is the government revenue and the expenditure recurrent expenditure was 16.1 now my point is those things if the government really wants to have uh, the the revenue earned from re- rupees and pay the rupee expenditures then the crisis is out of the icu because icu requires uh, 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 where the, the patient is treated in a more kind of uh, exterior manner now what happens is with the with the, the capital expenditure coming mostly dollar driven and they are not generating dollars enough for you to uh, 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 repay the debt that's where the, the the burden is accumulating uh, can i can i uh, uh, probably probably uh, hear from dr vijay singh and dr rajapatiran also please yeah can i uh, yeah it's a very tricky thing to define a crisis is okay If there is no crisis, that uh, as Professor Kotagama says, then you can ignore it. Can you ignore it? Can it's like the milk bottle that I left in my refrigerator is going bad? Uh, it will become a crisis in a couple of days. I know that I can't get near it. It starts smelling. But so uh, in that sense, we have a crisis because we can't ignore it. Okay, it is not self uh, self. Uh, uh, it is cannot do it by itself. Somebody had to intervene. The government had to intervene. That is why we 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 are in the ICU. Yeah, so, we are we are we are in the ICU. There is no denial. If you are not in the ICU, we we don't have to worry about it. Then we can say it is a dip. But otherwise, we are in the ICU. It is a crisis. Yeah. No. The point is that there are things that have to be addressed. If you don't address it, that growth rate is going to fall, as everybody knows here in the group. Now. Uh, the reason i give you some reason why one of, why did we switch because we didn't want to go to the world bank and the, uh, the uh, imf uh, so that is so there and also then we have passed the threshold uh, using the world bank's uh, atlas method which is very weak by the way just dividing uh, uh, foreign currency by the official exchange rate you know what this that does and so we we also didn't want the people to inquire too much what is happening so that's why it was conveniently able to go and we had never defaulted 
Why didn't we default before? We didn't have crisis before because we had the 16th time the IMF came and intervened and gave us money uh, under some, you know, some program that, that we didn't want to take now. So now we are in a crisis because we have no uh, Father Christmas to come and say, no, don't worry, we look after you. We have given that up also. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarat Rajapatrino, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, question to you in the chat box. Yeah, I like uh, to. Yeah. What, yeah, what specific solutions do you propose to current crisis as opposed to the solutions to our perennial economic challenges? Yeah, because the current crisis is what I started. I, obviously, I didn't do a good job. Deal with the things that have come up, like a fertilizer. The plan to import uh, cars uh, or you pay in dollars. They suddenly ban something without telling what is going, you know. Uh, don't do those things. Don't do the bad things that going to people are going to be very uh, sort of dis disappointed with. Uh, but deal with what is now just happened saying, for example, fertilizer, we'll say now import, it already there is something in the, in the, in the works. Uh, to say we are we are allowing not only uh, carbonic the other stuff also non carbonic if you like and so why did we get into that without thinking about it what is the relationship between our expertise in this country and people who make uh, uh, judgments people who make decisions were they been were, were they sub, well uh, sort of briefed uh, and so you know and who briefed them uh, so there are issues like that. Deal with those things. Uh, you know, the definition of a crisis can take different ways. Like we can define in different ways. My definition is that crisis is some situation in which you don't have to respond. It will be self corrected This is not self corrected period. Uh, Dr. Vijay Singha, you want to uh, say something? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the uh, topic is uh, the current economic crisis. Crisis is a subjective uh, term. It is not coming from economic uh, jargon. It's not a recession or depression. Uh, in that sense, the current uh, features of our economy, the contracted uh, GDP and uh, the uh, slow growth of exports, I think those are the dimension of, of uh, yeah. this crisis and there is a crisis. Uh, to measure the temporal uh, variation of this, actually, we don't have uh, time enough data for that. This started in 2020. Yes, uh, there was uh, economic contraction. Right now, uh, we are seeing a growth. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, the, the question is, OK, if there was no uh, COVID, uh, whether we would be better. Uh, we would be better in relative terms, of course, uh, but uh, we had structural weaknesses. That's why, why we use those uh, data from uh, the historical uh, data sets. We are increasing our emphasis on the domestic uh, production. We are giving preference to the domestic production. And we are not integrating to the global market to capitalize our comparative advantage. You can uh, see that uh, if you look at uh, the data and uh, effective protection rate the, that was uh, rising with uh, time. So those are the structural issues we are having in this uh, country. Because of, uh, the, because of these structural issues, we are not in a position to manage this uh, shock. Uh, it is a crisis, I think. Uh, I don't know if uh, it's not a crisis. Politicians do not have to take these uh, drastic measures. Why, why our politicians have controlled uh, imports? First, they were selective. We compiled actually all the data. Uh, first, they, they avoid uh, imposing <coughs> import controls on uh, intermediate goods. But uh, with the successive uh, waves of import controls, they moved towards intermediate goods as an example, agricultural uh, uh, inputs. So those are signs of uh, crisis. No government wants to uh, resort into these drastic measures because these have political uh, implications. If you look at the protests around the country, the, most of these are 
uh, motivated by uh, these economic uh, measures. Uh, politicians are not that foolish to take these measures without uh, a crisis. They, they are forced to take these measures. Yeah, that's my- okay, thank, uh, you. thank you, Dr. Vijay Singha. Uh, the Tisuri Roji, uh, you, uh, floor is yours. You, are, you have raised your hand up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gunaran. Uh, I'm sorry, this is sort of a different point. It's not relevant to what was discussed so far. Uh, this question is directed towards uh, Dr. Gun uh, Singha. Uh, this is regarding the interesting point that was brought about uh, regarding the human resource gap um, and the kind of disillusionment that young people feel and uh, their plans, many, plan, uh, many people plan to migrate. Uh, so my first question is, uh, so do you have any specific suggestions uh, regarding what can be done to sort of incentivize them to remain in the country and be hopeful about the future of the country? And I understand that this is not purely economical. There might be other reasons as well. Um, and secondly, that uh, if this kind of outward labor might migration is happening, uh, are there any opportunities or any ways that we can sort of capitalize from that as well? For example, is there a way we can uh, sort of look at earning remittances from this kind of migration? Thank you. Well, thank you, Roji, for that question. I also have my uh, second thoughts about this uh, uh, labor migration issue. Uh, well, we can discuss, but I would probably first want to have the, the input from Dr. Dhanu Singh. Uh, Dr. Uh, Singha? Yes, yes, uh, you can hear me, I guess. Yes, uh, we hear you. I think, uh, I think uh, one, if I answer the first one, like the second one first, um, theoretically, uh, we say that uh, the those who go abroad, for studies, for work, they will, uh, with the time lag, they will send more money, they will come back and invest, they will bring in more skills, and there will be a skill transfer, and as a result, uh, the developing countries or the, the sending countries will benefit with this migration flow. That is a theoretical explanation. But empirically, if you look at to what extent this particular phenomenon have taken place, it is really doubtful with the African experience, even in the Latin American experience, so that that particular uh, positive outcome is not there to some countries, but certainly in countries such as Korea, Taiwan, and some of the Southeast Asian countries, we have witnessed some positive outcomes due to labor migration. That is the number one. Then coming back to the first one, I think it is really, really hard at the moment to come out with certain policies uh, or the certain initiatives that should be uh, introduced in order to uh, give some hopes to the young people who are planning to go abroad. I think what we can see, uh, you know, during even in our lifetime, what we saw so far, clearly indicates that the political system in at present or in even in the past had no interest in introducing genuine reforms that could benefit the larger community in the society. Only they introduce reforms which uh, benefit to a smaller segment or the elite groups in the uh, elite groups and those who associate with them uh, will be benefited out of the reforms. And this is very much clear at the moment to uh, young people. Those which were clear somewhere in 1970s had a I mean, they initiated a fight against the government. Now the young people have decided uh, no point of fighting with the government, rather go, to go abroad. Go Dr. Dhanu Singh, now, now uh, um, uh, I, I think 
we have to focus this one in the current economic crisis i see um, professor hemasri kotagama is uh, pinning on me saying that hey please uh, direct this on the current economic he he doesn't like the word crisis but challenge now let me let me point out some 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 interesting uh, statistics by 2017 we had 4.6 months of imports as our reserves yeah by 2020 one we are down to 1.8 months so we have uh, uh, no resource resources we have no buffer to meet our imports bill now when we don't have that buffer uh, sufficient amount of dollars to import our essentials then the only alternative that we have in the short run is to borrow so you go and borrow then you you are you are down to the same scenario that you go and ask from a, a, a kind of a lending community which have no uh, kind of trust in you to lend money so you are where are you now standing in that's basically our crisis now let me let me put it in a different way in a way i think that this crisis is better because if you had 4 months 4.6 months of uh, that uh, that uh, that breathing space our people will be spending lavishly on unwanted projects and other things and going ahead with it so my situation is this crisis is better and these people are not self disciplining kind of lot and they they need to be facing this sort of a crisis in the icu for them to behave uh, uh, behave uh, in 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 a, in a more disciplined manner so let's try to come up to the the the, the crisis now your labor part of it and then people migrating those things are long lasting impacts i'm not saying that those are not important but the point is what is the uh, the the remedy for our current crisis what is the current crisis output professor kotagama is adamant he says that current crisis is corona okay if it is corona moment we are out of corona the situation is over yeah. but the point is corona out does not mean that yeah. that we will be out of the crisis we will be still in the icu please your your inputs to that and i also see uh, mr indrajit akwansu is raising the hand up but first uh, let's 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 get the answer to that question now how do we go to face the immediate problem of importing the essentials now we go to bangladesh and 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 borrow money and we go to some other country and say that look you know we 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 please give us a uh, uh, good uh, petroleum to credit now that's the crisis represented now when we were young we we uh, we were talking about bangladeshi walalu and we were talking about bangali uh, bangali walalu and also uh, olinda tibenne koi koi dese olinda tibenne bangali dese now we go to bangali dese for dollars now isn't it a crisis for me it is a crisis so you want me to answer please answer yes i think uh, now as ஒன் <laughs> which are dedicated for this type of issues for like is example if no, no, i will come directly mention the name of the institution where you have to seek the uh, assistance now the with respect to whenever a country get into the balance of payment crisis the imf is set up in order to address such yeah. uh, address such issues yeah, so why not you seek the imf assistance then there is IMF no crisis assistance come with the no then there is no crisis yes there is no structural reforms are very important in order to address the structural weaknesses in the country right the that yes, there is, is no crisis because they need to then, undertake the structural reforms so that you go to imf problem. and the problem is over if you think that way then there is no crisis why do you want so to be I, in imf you whenever you get into a crisis there is a internal there is a mechanism Yeah. rather than asking for atamaru here and there for bangladesh japan china and all these things there is a mechanism in place I, yeah 
you know you have to all right all right all right to, so uh, so what what happens uh, is uh, you get the support there is someone to give you atamaru so because of that you behave so irresponsibly and when you face a crisis you go to that place because there is there is, uh, there is that body to give you atamaru no, no, i mean is no, that no, the no. way of solving one, the crisis one, one thing that i want to very much uh, make it clear now we have faced this situation due to some of the structural problems inherited in the economy now the solution must come with the no with the short term short term solution of finance in the deficit as well as re required reforms to correct the structural weaknesses now when you get the atamar what happen is that you get the get solved the pro short term problem but the structural weaknesses will remain in the economy that mean that's, that's again the within the next uh -huh. Two that's precisely the time point. we will get back yeah. to the yeah. there is a, crisis again yeah there is a, there is an interesting uh, remark uh, given by uh, uh, dr sasini uh, she is saying that how long are we going to depend on uh, uh, imf to bail us out already 16 times and do you want to have it for another 161 times and, uh, and professor bularuan uh, uh, shall we give a chance yeah. to uh, aponsu yeah that, we, i i want to come to indrajit aponsu but before that uh, there is a short uh, uh, response Uh, that uh, professor kotagama wants to give can i give my short answer please professor kotagama yes 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 i am here yes please give uh, your brief answer uh, since i agitated all of you all now let me try to rest all of you all as well i really Best appreciate uh, dr sarath's uh, definition of a crisis i really appreciate it it gives me a good start to think which he said uh, if it, if the situation is not self correcting it is a crisis that's so that's a way to begin thinking about it at least otherwise we were talking about a crisis of not knowing what a crisis is so uh, are we in in such a situation yes we may be yeah, now yeah. i agree yes now i agree to, uh, to a certain extent uh, so yet we should consider this as a very very you know it's an outlier situation Yeah. covid was never expected and it happened so so we have to our our economic thinking theory and so forth does not explain this this phenomenon uh, so we have to think uh, uh, we have to be empathizing with the situation and look for solutions and the solutions also ought to be in the long term so we have to keep that focus and here are my suggestions one two three as i go first thing is as dr dumsing suggests since i identify this as a foreign exchange crisis to be precise there are many other things that we can keep on talking about but as of now it is a foreign exchange issue so i agree with professor doc, uh, dr sorry dr dumsing who has been saying this on television screens over and over again keeping up our ego about international relationships we have to go for an imf bailout it's a bit difficult to take up that jargon but we are in a situation of that nature where we need a bailout we cannot be begging this is an international institution which is meant for it and we should use that opportunity number 2 number 2 uh, we cannot take loans we, our ratings are down down on the drains so that is no option now so that is why imf then domestically we should look for ways of earning the foreign exchange i think tourism would recover fast i think so i have read so many articles about the psychology of people being locked up for so long uh, and 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 this i think will open up fast so we should go for tourism prepare our domestic you know infrastructure and how to clean up your hotels clean up get 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 the people back okay this is all sub subject to getting covid right which i think we have got right i am not a medical specialist to judge it finally but the psycho of it is being corrected thanks to the government on that then we should get the agricultural issue resolved i am an agricultural economist i am not going to say much about it i am going to just say we should get our agricultural issue resolved and then once these things are smoothed we can go to whatever that have been discussed in this forum of getting the structural adjustments okay 
bringing down the, 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 the deficits, getting the taxes right. If we want, we can go towards independence in food security, which is being talked. Uh, we, can, we can isolate ourselves, uh, deglobalize if you want, but the, all those can be kept for once we resolve. I emphasize the current economic crisis, not the economic challenges of the country in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you, Professor Kotagama. Thank you very much. Indrajit Apansu, you are, uh, you are for, um, Mr. Indrajit Apansu, the floor is yours. Indrajit, floor is yours. Camera on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I must say that I I uh, I have to say I'm not talking uh, here as an economist or anybody uh, as a uh, uh, ordinary citizen, uh, and uh, I'm raising something very fundamental as well. But before we go to uh, this particular topic, is uh, crisis. Uh, I uh, there's there's discussion and counter discussion, uh, which is quite the the normal thing between economists. We talk please to each brief. other. I mean, we just brief. can't explain the issue to anybody please else. Be brief. You are you know, and we love to be disagree in disagreement in your own ivory towers. And as a result, the economies have become a closed community. Nobody takes us seriously. Businesses don't take us seriously. And as a result, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm making this particular issue that most of our discussions, we talk. What is your particular question? Please raise My your question. My particular question is this. This, uh, 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 the, the, well, of course, now the, the, there were several questions I wanted to ask, but uh, with regard to the word of crisis, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, Sri Lankan economy, uh, uh, there's a historical crisis that we had, which was the balance of payment crisis, the trade balance crisis, which started from 1977 and which we never fixed it. And then it was going on. There was a talk about going to IMF and all that. But this was, again, we created short-term solutions to postpone the crisis and then when we hit uh, at a situation where we, we ran short of all the uh, uh, ammunition and, and the support schemes, which the COVID brought in, I, I have, we, we don't have solutions. So this you, is the situation even before, at the moment. So, but uh, to may say that it is a crisis, uh, I'm not quite uh, in agreement. The reason being, uh, there are countries which have gone through crisis, uh, which are very serious crises. For example, 1997 East Asian crisis, that was a damn crisis, but we never had that kind of situation yet. But of course, there can be a crisis in the future if we can't handle this thing uh, to a certain uh, manageable level. Yeah, but uh, Mr. Aponso, what is your point? Please say. Uh, the, point is, the point is uh, the point is the point that was raised uh, by uh, uh, a previous uh, uh, audience is that the, the 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 definition of crisis and how this crisis should be managed now. Uh, the, the present situation is that, uh, my, uh, as, as I say, is that uh, the way that we present it as a crisis, it's a more political rather than actually uh, looking at it uh, from a, a very uh, measurable point of view. So That's you mean to say that we are, we are not in a crisis and we cannot pay our uh, next, uh, next month's petroleum bill and, and the people are not opening LCs and, and we, are having, we are having a problem of uh, no bidders for our coal supply uh, for the next uh, next supply, and then when the coal supply does not come up, then we will be probably forty five percent of our electricity is through coal power, and then we will not have electricity uh, in the coming period. I'm not saying that these things are going to happen, but if we don't get this kind of a situation right, do you think we don't think that is a crisis? No, the point is now you guys are talking about there is a crisis. What I'm trying to say is that the the situation at the moment is uh, not in a crisis situation, but it can turn into a crisis uh, in, in the future if things uh, don't uh, work out the way that uh, are being expected, which is quite possible the case. So, but making uh, it to be uh, uh, identified as a crisis right now, it's not very, uh, 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 very fair because there's a global crisis uh, with regard to the COVID and which is basically affecting everybody else as well. But the Sri Lankan situation was somewhat different because we had a perennial crisis of balance of payment and that has not been fixed. And that really ran short of solutions under the crisis situation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vijay Singh, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I want to add that uh, actually, hey, um, Mr. Ponsu said that uh, 
after 1977, we started to face this crisis and uh, started going to uh, IMF. I don't know whether it is correct. According to my understanding and reading, it is not correct. We were facing this crisis even before 1977. The first uh, finance minister who wanted to go to uh, IMF, who suggested was, was actually Dr. Andam Pere. He was a great pragmatist. Uh, he believed that uh, it was a solution. They were also facing the crisis. Uh, I want to say this, uh, if you take this as a foreign exchange crisis, yes, it is a foreign exchange crisis and there is a fiscal crisis too. So what is uh, the solution? Of course, borrowing more. And we need to borrow that uh, for, from institutes that uh, are, are willing to give us that in favorable terms, as an example, IMF. But, uh, okay, so our policymaker and some economists, we can see that they vehemently reject that approach. What is the solution? The solution is what is government practicing now, import control. So Dr. Uh, Professor Gunuran says that, okay, people are largely spending, uh, yeah, uh, there are research too that, uh, even in food, there are two parts, caloric utility and recreational utility. You can spend, you can uh, purchase 2000 calories for rupee, 1000 rupees and also 1500 rupees. That's, you are not efficient. But if you look at data using HIES, uh, household income and expenditure survey data, uh, the poor people, especially food poor people, they are caloric efficient. That means they are, they are purchasing as much as they can using their limited budget. And if you look at the import dependency ratio of this caloric intake of the poor people and the urban people, they are the people, especially a state sector and urban sector poor people, they eat a lot of import, imported calories, maybe from wheat, lentils, Etc. So it is not only luxuries. So these are the commodities which are subjected to import controls in the first waves of the government. So they first targeted the cons consumption goods. So this crisis is disproportionately affecting poor people. That's another dimension of this uh, crisis. We need to talk about that. That's why we are saying that if government is able to borrow to uh, get rid of this uh, short-term uh, foreign exchange uh, crisis. We should do that because uh, the alternative approach the government is following will have far-reaching distributional impact. That means poor people will be more affected and especially this uh, agricultural uh, input ban, it will affect our long-term uh, growth trajectory. Uh, it will affect our for the structural transformation. The, yeah, that and even environment. I'm not going to talk about that. If you look at pulses consumption, 95% of calories uh, taken from uh, consumption of pulses were from imported sources. And now almost all of those uh, imports are banned or temporarily suspended due to this uh, economic uh, crisis. I don't think any politician. Uh, will uh, do such thing if uh, they can manage that without uh, going to, uh, without uh, resorting to the import control. So we as economists, what we can do is, these are the costs and benefits of two approaches, borrowing more and uh, import controls. And according to my understanding, import controls will have uh, more cost than benefits. So borrowing is better. That's the solution uh, for this uh, crisis right now. Thank you. So we will, uh, I think uh, there are no more questions uh, waiting. Uh, it is also uh, nearly one hour more we have spent. I think it is high time to uh, uh, stop the discussion. It was very animated and uh, very lively discussion. Let me uh, allow Dr. Dunu Singha and uh, Dr. Raja Patirana to have uh, the final uh, two words before I wrap up. So very briefly, if you want to also uh, say something, uh, first Dr. Dunu Singha and then last Dr. Raja Patirana. Dr. Dunu Singha. 
I think uh, uh, Dr. Asanka very correctly mentioned one of the uh, important point that many forget in the current debate with the current restriction on imports, poor people pay heavily. The cost paid by the poor, that is the truth. The local companies making profit out of the, the import controls, but the, it is the, the poor people who pay. I look at the, I analyze the impact of the uh, palm oil ban and how it affected the state sector, rural sector and the urban. It is very clear that they are the people who really paid for these nonsense. I, I must say that nonsense, I think it is reasonable. Uh, so that it is something uh, that need to be uh, taken into consideration by the policymakers. And you, the policymakers can argue or the politician may argue, we don't go to IMF, but the poor people pay the price. So the, this kind of stubborn decisions will have a repercussions will go down the line of you know uh, what we have achieved during the last 10 or 15 years with respect to the poverty reduction with respect to the human capital development and with respect to other things and in 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 this context uh, the solution is to go to imf with the policy reform package where uh, we address the loan run, uh, loan term structural weaknesses in the economy, not just the uh, what we have weakness. I don't think that whether you get the Atamaru and even if you solve the issues here, right now, it won't solve the loan term issues. So uh, in right now, the economy, what is needed is to go, a, go for a structural reforms in order if we, if the government is aim at, aiming at attracting foreign direct investments to Fort City and to the other areas, if it is the investment that is expected, not the borrowing, we need to get a uh, investment investor friendly business environment in place that is not there, that is not happening at the moment. So I think we may go on with this trajectory or the, with this uh, economic crisis for another one to one and a half years. Uh, even though with the end of the COVID, even if we say, say we will see a very fast recovery of tourism, I don't expect. I don't expect even the, if you go with the WTO, World Tourism Organization own prediction, uh, they don't expect the tourism sector to recover until end of 2024. And uh, with that, uh, I don't think that the tourism alone can be in the prosperity to Sri Lanka. There are much more things needed in for generating productive employment for the uh, young people. And that is not taken place without introducing correct reforms. With the agriculture sector, uh, intervention or the, the policies, what has happened? There was uh, some amount of entrepreneur, young entrepreneurship in the agriculture sector that is over now with this, with the current decision. I think Professor Jivika can add more to that. Uh, so, a uh, lot of uh, social repercussions, not just the economy, but the social repercussions will be uh, ahead of us and we will see. Uh, the cost of the current policies in years to come. Thank you. Thank and you very I much, just, Dr. Uh, Professor Gunarwan just gave me three minutes. Four yes, minutes. yes. You, you, you are. You I, are, I are, think that, okay. yeah, I, I think. Uh, okay. You are muted. Uh, you are muted. Okay, okay. Right. Now, yeah. Now, this banning imports is a something, no, it is not a solution. It will make it even worse because we have no respect for comparative cost, comparative 
uh, advantage of that we have. Okay, because first of all, as a theoretical macroeconomic theory tells you that this putting an import ban does not deal with the demand side. <laughs> so you put a, you completely put a, uh, say everything is going to be banned, uh, then uh, the goods go up in price and it's a distribution of income from the poor people to the rich people. Poor people now pay more for, for, a, for a good that is not imported anymore. More than that, it is not a solution or can never be a solution for a balance of payments problem. It's a different problem that we are trying to try to address through an import ban. Now, finally, finally, we have experience. We have done that. We have done this. We have seen the movie before. 1977, we tried it and we failed. And so that even so, uh, Dr. N. Empire said, let's go to the IMF. We saw the EC, the, that was the proper, proper solution to use in those circumstances. So this is a this is, this is no out from here. If you go to the idea of banning imports, when you ban imports, you are also ban exports. They increase the bias against exports. So we have no idea that these things, have, I can't understand how we can end up in this situation. That's it. Thank I'm you very much. Thank you very much. It was very lively discussion. Uh, and uh, um, all the three panelists from my side, uh, Dr. Dunu Singh, uh, Dr. Vijay Singh and uh, Dr. Sarath Rajapatirana, thank you very much for taking your time and then uh, elaborating on the current economic crisis. Uh, I hope uh, Dr. Jivika would want to say something at the end before I wrap up. Or Dr. Jivika would want me to wrap up and uh, finish it off. Yeah. Professor Jivika? Yeah. Over to say. Yeah. All what I want to say is thank you. A big thank you to uh, Dr. Sarath Rajapatirana. Dr. Asanka Vijay Singh and Dr. Priyant Dhanu Singh. It was a very lively uh, program. And uh, of course, uh, I personally learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very oh, much. Yes, let me let me end up the this thing, uh, the discussion with an anecdote. We had uh, uh, a drunkard fellow in our village. And the man every day had something more to spend than what he earned. And every day he went, he went to a boutique and said, uh, Mudalali, I, I need a, a pound of uh, uh, paripu, uh, uh, but I have no money. So Mudalali puts his name on a book and said, okay, so much is in debt. Next day he goes and then he, uh, and he, does not, he does not have money. So Mudalali says, well, uh, um, you, you, you got uh, Paripu yesterday, you did not pay for it. Okay, okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. So again, ent entry in a book. And then, likewise, you go every day accumulating, accumulating, accumulating your debts. And then one fine day, the Mudalali says, look, this is not done. Because Mudalali also uh, looks at the man's behavior. Uh, he does not meet his ends, but every day he had a, a bottle uh, of Arak to drink. And then he goes and uh, behaves in a very bad way and uh, gambling and all these things. And then he comes up and says that his uh, 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 any, uh, ends cannot be met with his income. So Mudalali says, Make a hasiri So Mudalali says, if I want, if you if if lending has to be given to you more, you better behave better. So simply because IMF, the name, three letters, if we are to reject the good behaviors that they recommend, it's a stupidity. On the other hand, I don't think that you should be surrendering all your sovereignty to IMF or any other lender. The first thing that you do is practice, adopt good behaviors by yourself. And the good behaviors of not lavishly spending, I would say control imports. I mean, I'm not buying, uh, I'm not saying that the imports have to be, you know, uh, liberalized uh, in uh, lock, stock and barrel. And when I go to a supermarket, I see Hakuru. Uh, produced in uh, uh, in Indonesia being imported and in the stores of supermarkets and you don't need to import Hakuru and I don't think that uh, you know uh, uh, some tax levied on Hakuru is going to be a crime in this country so whatever you can you can produce in this country you can uh, uh, live with the I mean Dr. Vijay Singh said that 
you uh, there are there are uh, you know things which will probably impoverish the people because you know the poor people are getting their proteins and uh, other uh, you know um, uh, nutrients from imports well 1000 2000 years this country lived without uh, you know imported things uh, you know we did not lose any nutrients in our in our in our society so i mean there are there are limits to this uh, nonsense also no? now if you don't have income one way is to in, in, increase your income mudalali will have to say look here you better earn more and come to my boutique and then then i will pay you the second way the second thing is that you know you control your expenditure and then come to my boutique you can't go borrowing every time and accumulating your debt what will mudalali say at the end mudalali will come up and say look you guy may be a good man but your son may be a nasty fellow now i don't know what is going to happen if if this debt accumulated i will never recover ஏட்டா என்ன கூட வாகி கெதர ஒப்பு அரங்கின் ஐ வில் மன்லங்க தியாண்ட ஃபார் ஃபார் யூ டு ஃபார் யூ டு போரோ மோ அண்ட் தட் இஸ் வாட் we are doing now அப்பே ஒப்பு தென் அப்பி கீல்ல தியனோ ஏக ஏக ராட்டவல் வரட அப்பே மே இடம தேனோ அப்பே அர ஹவல் லெக தேனோ அப்பே सर्टेन अदर थिंग्स बीइंग लीज दैट फॉर्म அண்ட் தி ப்ராப்ளம் இஸ் தட் ஐ அக்ரி வித் 100% ஆல் தி 3 परसेंटेज தட் இஸ் we ஆர் பேட் மேனேஜர்ஸ் ஆஃப் आवर अफेयर्स it is an internal affair not an external thing and we have been continuously living beyond our means so let's come to our basic buddhist economics live within your means we have nearly 40% of our people living within 2 dollars a day i was told their their per capita income uh, about a significant percentage of our people are earning 2 dollars a day so if the people could live with 2 dollars a day nearly 20 40% of our population now how the hell we have got average 10 dollars a day as income 10 dollars a day as income and average means that there are people who are earning even you know 20 dollars a day now tax those fellows and why why can't they also live with 2 dollars a day and why should we run our countries uh, 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 run down our countries in exchange to feed those heavy class of expenditure now the point is this discussion went into crisis this discussion talked about different uh, 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 different uh, sides of the the, the the crisis but one important aspect of income distribution uh, 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 problem is, was not discussed now there we have a huge gap between haves and have nots in this country and that is the whole reason why we also cannot manage certain things because people want imported items that that we cannot go and control so my recipe to this is behave ourselves whenever you borrow in dollars the dollar incomes have to be dollar incomes have to be invested in repayable projects only you need to earn dollars to pay your dollar uh, borrowings and dollar debt servicing expenditures only you should be borrowing otherwise you are running into a dollar crisis now you want to borrow anything on rupees that can be handled within the local economy now the point is that our successive governments have been borrowing in projects which are 10 20 times the uh, the the competitive uh, prices in the world market and none of those are earning or saving even a single dollar the first example i can give is expressways and those expressways are direct subsidies to the rich people not to the poor man because expressways are maintained at the budget uh, expenditure and we are not recovering money uh, enough from the user and we are talking about subsidized poor man but the subsidies are to the rich man now we are uh, arguing against petroleum price increase petroleum prices have to be increased why because we are subsidizing the rich man's car by petroleum prices being kept below the market price and nobody is talking about those and if you really want to subsidize the poor man let's subsidize the railway and the ctb so by that way you you the the the, the poor man's transportation mobility can be guaranteed the so my my point is our economic crisis is something created by our governments and our people who are living beyond our means so let's live within our means thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i uh, i really enjoyed the discussion i really uh, 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 like the, the 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 way the uh, the, the panelists uh, uh, argued it out and also the, the, the uh, 
the participants and thank you very much uh, professor jeevika for organizing this very lively discussion and thank you very much uh, uh, dr dilini for your all your efforts and 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 uh, uh, and your organizing uh, inputs so uh, i declare that the seminar is closed dr dilini you. you want to say something on it thank you final uh, close up uh so i will thank you sir since you thank everybody else uh thank you very much for moderating the event and thank you all for participating and i wish you all a very good night